Last week we discussed the styles of communication by Schulz von Thun. But uh, what if we realized that we tend to use certain styles uh, frequently and excessively? How can we develop further? Grab your favorite drink, make yourself comfortable. We'll take a look at that today. Welcome to the Soft Skill channel. My name is Sebastian Jung and today we will talk about Schulz von Thun's communication styles from the perspective of personal development. I think this video can be understood pretty well on its own, but there are two other videos that might be helpful and with them maybe it's a bit more fun. The first is the last week's video uh, where I described the communication styles and the second is the one about Schulz von Thun's square of development which we will apply today. I will provide links to both videos in the video description below. When we use the needily dependent style we show our weakness and our helplessness and we give the other person the impression that he really needs to step in, provide support, take responsibility and help us. <clears throat> Sorry. How does one develop such a behavior? Where does it come from? It's something we learn and Schulz von Thun believes that the childhood is especially important here because our personality, our character is molded in childhood in a way that is especially lasting. When uh, we were little children, we wanted to explore the world and learn new things and try everything. And then mommy, daddy or someone else stepped in and said, Oh, you're too little for that. Oh, you'll only get dirty. Not like that. Give it to me. I will do it. And if you hear this frequently enough as a small child, sooner or later, um, a corresponding self-image will be established, where you are helpless and dependent on others. This, just as a small example, I will not discuss um, the, the reasons for each of the, of the styles, because what we are mostly interested in is, if I notice that I tend to do this, that I tend to um, push my problems onto others, that I tend to avoid a responsibility and things like that. What can I do to outgrow this behavior to develop further? First, we should appreciate the good aspects of the needily dependent style because those should be preserved. When using the needily dependent style, we are able to face our own weakness and helplessness. We are able to ask for help and able to accept help. These are very important skills that we want to preserve. However, we are taking things way too far uh, to the point where we deny our own self-reliance and um, are excessively dependent on others. I have visualized our direction of development using Schulz von Thun's development square. From being in denial of, of our own self-reliance, we want to develop towards more autonomy and more responsibility. While doing this, we want to maintain the ability to admit our own need for help, so we don't overcompensate to the point where we are in denial of our own need for help. Schulz von Thun recommends two approaches that might help here. The first is to learn a language of responsibility. Because 
our language shapes our thoughts and by consciously changing our language we also work on our attitudes. If we say I don't want to instead of I can't or I have decided instead of I must, then we take responsibility for our actions and we no longer experience ourselves as pawns of outer circumstances. Then we can also change the way we ask for help. <clears throat> we say openly and specifically what we want, where we ask for other per uh, another person's support. By doing this, by doing this, we still ask for help and we still accept help, but we. Um, <clears throat> Um, we are still in charge and we are still responsible and furthermore by using open appeals by clearly saying what we want we make our wishes transparent and we avoid manipulative behavior. Before we proceed to the next style I would uh, like to again point out that we are talking about communication styles here, not personality types. This is not a typology. Of course there are similarities and of course there are links between the communication styles and certain personality traits. However, typologies are about as scientifically sound as horoscopes and they include highly questionable pigeonholing. We will talk about this topic in a future video. For now, just keep in mind, this isn't about saying, oh yeah, this guy, totally needily dependent, I immediately noticed. This would be quite the wrong direction. With the helping style, we appear strong and confident and we are able to help and support others. This is the good side of the helping style that we wish to preserve. However, even here we like to take things too far. One problem that might occur is that we use the helping and the supporting of others as a means to not have to face our own weakness, our own need for help. And this leads to one-sided relationships where we are always the one giving help and support, but we are never able to receive help and support. Here the square of development is the same as for the needily dependent one, but with the opposite direction of development from denial of our own need for help to the ability to admit our own weakness and our own need for help. Schulz von Thun points out that um, accepting your own weakness is very difficult if we have avoided doing that for uh, years or for all our lives. So it might be easier to work on our behavior first by consciously asking for help and consciously talking about our own worries and problems. <clears throat> Another problem that might occur is that um, as helpers we are not able to distance ourselves uh, from the problems and the misery we encounter and we start to suffer along with our warts and um, the misery we see puts great psychological um, pressure on us and um, this also leads to the problem that when we see misery we can't deny our support even if we are already at the breaking point and uh, it's getting too much for us. Mm. 
here it is very important to learn to set boundaries, to learn to keep an inner distance so we are able to continue providing support and providing help without um, putting ourselves in a troublesome position and without suffering ourselves along with the people we want to help. Um, concerning the people we are helping and supporting, here we have the danger that we are overprotective. So um, the people we help um, are kept in a state of dependency, be it because we mean too well and do more than um, is necessary, or be it because we unconsciously want to maintain our own position of superiority. Here it is very important to not only help and support, but also to challenge, because we want to help <clears throat> Sorry, because we want to help our wards to develop and to outgrow the dependency and to be able to help themselves. So we have to make sure we not only support but also challenge and we don't get into uh, this overprotective behavior. When we use the selfless style, we subordinate ourselves, we elevate the other person and we try to please him in any way. The good side here is the ability to devote ourselves to someone, to go beyond our own wishes and desires and really be there for someone else. This is what we want to preserve. However, we also want to be able to stand up for ourselves, to be self-assertive and to fight for our own, our own wishes and desires. In Germany and probably in your country as well, there are courses for self-assertiveness. Um, here we have several that focus on the prevention of sexualized violence, um, which are often combined with uh, uh, learning self-defense, but there are also some where you just learn to be more self-conscious and uh, to speak up for yourselves, or where you learn to be more assertive in a business environment. For relationships, Schulz von Thun recommends an exercise you can perform with your partner. It's called Master and Servant. Um, for half a day, one of you takes on the role of master, the other one takes on the role of servant. And after half a day, you switch roles. The former servant becomes the master and the other way around. Now for the selfless style. Being the servant usually is quite easy, but being the master is a big challenge and a good exercise. Schulz von Thun writes that the most important word that um, selfless people have to learn is I. And the second most important is no. Because refusing a request is very important. It's a very important ability, especially when we talk about uh, self-assertiveness. Here Schulz von Thun recommends a technique by Alan Garner. Um, he describes an example where a friend asks you to cover for him in... Um, um, a signature collection and he says yeah it's very important for me and it's it's for a good cause and whatnot now the first step is 
you agree to all the points you uh, think are agreeable. For example, by saying, yes, I understand that this is very important to you. I see that this is a good cause and, and I personally also support this cause. And the second step is you reject his request. You might give reasons, but it's not strictly necessary. So for example, you say, but I do not want to cover for you. It's all getting too much for me. Then if the other person continues to put pressure on you and continues to ask for your help, for example, saying, yeah, but, it, but it's such an important issue and it's relevant also to you and I'm really in a, in a tricky situation here, you continue to agree to the agreeable points. Yes, it's important to me personally. I totally agree with that. I can see that you are in a tricky situation. And then you repeat your rejection with exactly the same words. But I don't want to cover for you. It's getting too much for me. Now, this technique is obviously intended as a jump start. Working through such a list and repeating yourself like a broken record is obviously not ideal communication. However, if we are not used to rejecting requests, if this is totally new and difficult for us, then such a technique can help us get started. When we use the aggressive devaluating style, we are only too happy to confront and to criticize. We don't hesitate to point our finger and we don't hesitate to accuse. The good side of the aggressive devaluating style is to be able to openly express criticism and to not shy away from a confrontation. However, what we need to learn is not only to command respect for our own, but also to show respect. To not only be able to make clear statement, but also to be able to proceed with tact and be diplomatic. And not only to criticize, but also to be able to acknowledge the achievements of others and to be able to express honest praise. For this, we can perform a small exercise. We think of someone we have an overall bad opinion of someone we don't think is much good. Then we write down all the good things that we can say about this person. Um, good character traits, good qualities, situations where this person behaved well, their achievements and merits. If absolutely nothing comes to mind for you there, then you might want to um, consciously observe the interactions with this person you have in the near future and consciously look out for positive aspects. Once you have collected a few positive aspects, think about which of those you ever have told or shown that person. And maybe there will be a good op opportunity to do so soon. When we use the self-demonstrating style, we show our strength and our successes. We believe that we are surrounded by judges and rivals and that we need to prove ourselves at all times. The positive sides here are energy and motivation and the ability to acknowledge our own strength and to show them openly. However, we tend, to look, uh, we tend to put a lot of pressure to perform on ourselves. This might go that far that even harmless everyday situations become a test for us. When we play a board game with friends, when we um, um, are host to guests, when we have sex, we believe that this is a test where we have to prove ourselves. We tend to believe that we are only 
lovable and only valuable if we are successful. Things we have to learn are leisure and relaxation. Mindfulness exercises, meditation or relaxation techniques can help us here. It's often difficult to get started. If we do something like just sitting there quietly and observing our own breath, we often become nervous and we feel the pressure to perform all the things we could do with that time. However, it's worthwhile to stick to it for your well-being and maybe also for your health. Please note, however, that it is not sufficient to uh, squeeze the yoga class into your overcrowded schedule. You really have to look inward and um, um, really think about your motivation and your goals. The challenge in our communication behavior is to be able to also show our weaknesses, to take off the mask of perfection from time to time. Schulz von Thun writes that uh, sentences we would usually avoid, like I can't say anything about this at the moment, or I'm sorry, I'm not concentrated enough for this at the moment, that those have to be learned like vocabulary in a foreign language at first. What I recommend is to write down five to ten such sentences that suit your personality and personal situation and to consciously use one of them each day. With the determining and controlling style, we know exactly what is right and how to do things right and we don't get tired of explaining this to clueless people. The positive side is that we are able to provide <clears throat> sorry, that we are able to provide orientation for ourselves and for others, that we are able to um, give guidance and take the lead, that we are able to take on a role as a teacher or manager or maybe as a parent. However, the authorian style of leadership that is a combination of the determining and controlling style and the aggressive devaluating style. This is long outdated. Today, both leaders and educators and trainers, um, all of them are um, companions, coaches and facilitators. For this, it is important not only to guide and set up strict rules, but also to give room for development, to just let people do on their own without stepping in immediately once you see any tiny mistake. <clears throat> on the organizational side, it's important not to cling to structure and planning too strictly, but also to be able uh, to improvise and to be able to be flexible. In leadership, this means to acquire a cooperative leadership style. In education, this means to turn towards self-determined learning. It is also important to reflect upon ourselves because those strict rules and guidelines we put forth, those we also direct at ourselves. At the behavior level, a good first step is to phrase our appeals as personal wishes, not as proclamations of higher laws or norms. So, for example, we don't say, this is not appropriate, 
but we say, I don't want you to do that because. With the distance style, we keep our distance from other people and also from personal emotional topics. In some circumstances, distance is quite appropriate, for example, in our working life. Managers who place too much emphasis on cooperation and partnership often avoid making clear decisions and standing by their role. Here, the distance style helps us to cultivate a clear definition of roles. What we lack is the ability to approach other people, to allow for authentic encounters with other people, and um, to engage with someone. So our direction of development is from self-centeredness to devotion. A good exercise is active listening, because when we use the distance style, we tend to diagnose. Let's say you are talking with a friend and uh, he or she tells you that at their company um, a new software is being introduced and they are afraid they might not be able to cope with it, not be able to, to learn and use it. Now, diagnosing would be, for example, to say, um, oh, you've always been afraid of changes. Or, um, yeah, you, you've uh, always been skeptical of modern technology. Instead of this, try to just consciously listen and um, try to really understand their worries and their thoughts and what they are trying to tell you. Try to put yourself in their position and see the situation from their point of view. With the talkative dramatizing style, we are anything but shy of contact. We talk about ourselves uh, and our lives in detail and we hardly let the other person get a word in. On the good side, we have the willingness to get involved and the ability to talk about personal matters. What we need to learn is the ability to hold back, to listen attentively and to be, re to be responsive to the other person so a real dialogue can emerge, not just a monologue. Um, a good thing is to ask yourself from time to time, how much um, speaking time am I taking up in this conversation and how much am I... Um, allowing the other person to have. Is the topic I'm currently talking about something that I enjoy talking about or is it something that I think is relevant or interesting for the other person? A good exercise is to endure pauses in silence rather than immediately saying something to fill the silence. Schulz von Thun mentions that a technique that is usually used by people who easily throw tantrums can be helpful here, namely counting to 10 in your mind before you react. Um, once more, active listening can be quite helpful. Just shut up for a moment and really listen to what the other person has to say and try to really understand what is important to him or her and um, yeah, really try to um, understand what they are telling you. Um, I hope this video has been helpful and interesting to you and you enjoyed it. If this is the case, I would appreciate a like. And you might also want to subscribe to the channel to make sure you don't miss any future videos. In my channel I have a couple of more videos about Schulz von Thun's models and theories. Maybe those are interesting to you as well. 
We will see each other next week. For today I'll take my leave. Have a nice day. See you next time.